call this uh, meeting of the Hardin County Board of Education to order. If everyone will please stand, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you all. It's nice to see such a big crowd this evening. And Mr. Bland, do you have our board commitments? I will. To improve our effectiveness, the Hardin County Board of Education commits to keep children first, to listen, to be prepared, to be professional, to demonstrate financial stewardship, represent the entire district, and support district goals, and support board decisions. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Wright? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Um, we have several recognitions uh, this evening, Madam Chair, and uh, some of those uh, are the reason for our big crowd, but uh, you're going to see tonight uh, just, just uh, again, affirm what a great student body we have and great staff that we have. So if you'll pass that resolution, Madam Chair, we'll, we'll proceed. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. All right, thank you, um, Ms. Johnson. So if one of you guys can present some medals, we have several to present here this evening. First is to a young lady from James T. Alton Middle School, and I hope I say your name right, Araya. Is that right? Come on up, Araya. Come on. Come on up, Araya. Mr. Casey's gonna give you a medal. Uh, Raya is, like we said, is a student at James T. Alton Middle. She placed first in the state in the Secretary of State Michael Adams' state slogan competition. This year's theme was uh, increased poll worker recruitment, and so the slogan Araya submitted was, Fill Your Role, Join the Polls. This is the third consecutive year, uh, Board of Education, that a James T. Alton student has won the competition. Araya has been invited to the state capitol to meet Secretary Adams, which I think you already did over spring yes. break, yes, right? Uh, she took a personal tour of the capitol, and she met members of the General Assembly that represent her in Frankfurt. And I think a large part, Madam Chair, uh, and reason why um, James C. Alton students do so well with that is because of their social studies teacher, Mr. Rowland, who is in attendance tonight. Yeah. So. Uh, congratulations, Araya. Great job. Come on in. And Araya's mom, uh, parents are here. You guys stand up and wave. Be proud. All right, Ms. Payson Kugel. I saw Payson earlier. Come on up, Payson. Mr. Casey's going to give you a medal. And Chesney Pike. Chesney, I, saw, I know you're here. Yes. So... Payson and Chesney are Lakewood Elementary School fifth graders, and uh, they participated in the Kentucky Music Education Association State Choir, which is a very selective, and these two young ladies made it with help of their music teacher, Ms. Bennett, who is a rock star, we understand, and we appreciate you for being the rock star that you are. Thank you guys. And their Congratulations. Parents. And their parents, moms and dads. All right. I should also say that Ms. Kimball from Meadowview is here, and she is a cheerleader for this entire district. And so you, see, she'll get wild a little bit later when we honor somebody from Meadowview. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Uh, Roman Valera. Roman, are you here? Here's Roman. Roman is a Central Hardin High School sophomore. He was a state semifinalist in the 106-pound weight class at the KHSAA State Wrestling Tournament. Congratulations, wow. Roman. And, and parents. Oh, and parents, yes. <laughs> and parents. All right, Amari Hardin. Amari, are you here? Come on up, Amari. Amari is a John Harden High School senior, and he was a state semifinalist in the 120-pound weight class at the KHSAA State Wrestling Tournament. Congratulations. Wow. And Amari's, Amari's mom and dad, are you here? All right, thank you all. All right, Austin Silva. Austin Silva. 
Austin Silva is a John Harden High School senior. He earned the state championship in the 250 pound weight class at the KHSAA wrestling tournament. And here's an even more remarkable feat. He finished the season undefeated with a perfect mark of 68 and 0. Wow. Parents, parents, uh, Austin, there's, there's, there's Mrs. Silva. Braden Heron. Braden, are you here? Come on up, Braden. Braden is a North Harden High School senior. He earned the state championship in the 157 pound weight class at the KHSAA state tournament. And he finished the season undefeated with a perfect mark of 66 and 0. Congratulations, Braden. So congratulations, uh, Brayden. Yeah. Yeah, you have a family out there? Uh, yeah, my uh, moms and dads. Oh, all, right. Right. all right, we're going to go a little bit out of order uh, just to, to uh, help Mrs. Uh, Kimball feel a little bit better about herself. So, <laughs> so Kim Durant, come on up, Ms. Kim. <laughs> So Ms. Durant uh, is receiving the, uh, the faculty and staff uh, Better Together, or HCS Better Together Award. She's a teacher at Meadowview Elementary and is a treasured resource for her peers at Meadowview and across the district. She has been very helpful in creating literacy resources for her school and is very willing to share them all um, with uh, teachers across the district. The teachers uh, use them to help our students become proficient readers and she's created several choice boards, which allow students to select different activities and games focused on a particular skill, like initial sounds, final sounds, alphabet, to practice. They are fun and engaging for students. District leaders ask her to create a choice board that allows students to practice their literacy skills through a science concept and connection. She created it and has shared it with uh, teachers across the district. You are awesome. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. <laughs> So, didn't I tell you, um, Miss <laughs> Kimball, she's awesome. I think we've given her the Stronger Together Award sometime. Um, so anyway, our next recipients are our community members, um, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Jeff and Mary Key. Come on up, guys. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Key, come on up. Mr. Uh, Mr. Casey has a, a plaque for you. They are tremendous community supporters of Hardin County Schools. They operate Nolan, Nolan River Wildlife, which is a local sanctuary for animals to rehabilitate and prepare for a return to their natural habitat. They have welcomed an unknown number of HCS students for learning opportunities and experiences not available within the walls of the classroom. And they also provided a $100,000 gift, in addition to an already uh, base, strong base of generosity, to Western Kentucky University that will help HCS students. The gift will enhance the Jeff and Mary Key Scholarship. The gift helps Central Hardin High School students and students from Glendale attend Western Kentucky University. Mr. Key credits former East Hardin High School teacher Charles Young and WKU instructor D. Gibson for investing in him and showing him how to invest in others. We appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Awesome people, the, the uh, key family. And uh, we save the best for last. No, we save a wonderful person for last. Mr. Braden Hall, come on up. Braden. Yeah. Braden is a John Harden High School senior who is considered probably one of the most versatile and diversified students in the school's history. Beyond, uh, Braden participates and is successful in many activities, events, and competitions. He is active in FFA and has held local, regional, and state and uh, staff and state offices. He also participates and excels in choir activities and has sung at the National FFA Chorus. He's very active in youth theater of Hardin County and has performed in several events at the HCS Performing Arts Center. Nothing describes Braden, Braden better than servant leader. From a very young age, he displayed a natural ability to lead and serve with the demeanor and attitude of an older adult. 
Um, he is often in his elementary school years and second grade, he often checked in with his then principal, Mr. Billy Coffey at Ronnieville, to say, hey, are you good with substitutes today? And if you're not, I can help. <laughs> and he did that daily, from what I understand. <laughs> By eight years of age, uh, he had the official title of assistant director of the FFA Leadership Training Center uh, in his dad's class by arranging work schedules for staff and organizing the talent show at, at, at FFA. Braden has a true passion for serving and helping others. His accomplishments are many. However, nothing compares to the size of his heart and his experience for those around him worthwhile. Genuine leadership is hard to come by, and he makes it look easy. You are awesome. Thank you, Braden. <laughs> job is done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Always great to see all the all the great things that are going on. I'd like to welcome um, Ms. Aubrey Muse and Mr. Rick Ferreira to the, to the podium. Come on up here, guys. Uh, <laughs> they, um, they are with Candela, um, and Candela has been a tremendous partner of Hardin County Schools. In fact, they should probably get the, the Better Together Award someday, but they have uh, been a, a true asset from the time they've entered this community uh, in, in helping us with uh, STEM-based curriculum. And you'll see here in just a few minutes that they are truly dedicated to helping us with that cause. And so the folks at Candela are wonderful partners, and uh, they've got some great news that they're gonna share with us tonight. Uh, Aubrey Muse, Aubrey, come on up. Aubrey is a Central Hardin alum and uh, who went on to play softball at Harvard and also uh, graduate from Harvard. So uh, Aubrey and uh, Mr. Ferreira have some great news for us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Aubrey Muse, um, I'm a project developer at Candela Renewables. We're a small um, utility scale solar company out of San Francisco. Um, I'm from here. I grew up here. Um, I have with me Rick Ferreira. Rick's from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, he's also the project lead on the Stonefield Solar Project that we're developing um, around Cecilia. Um, but before that, as already mentioned, I was a Hardin County Schools product. I started at Rineville, went on to JTA, and finally graduated from Central Hardin. Um, had a wonderful experience. I always felt like this district really cared about its students and tried its best to give us all the opportunities that it could. Um, this thing we're about to announce is no different. Um, STEM-based education, I think, is a wonderful resource. It did me very well through college and now into my career. Um, I have to give Candela a lot of credit for taking a chance on a kid straight out of college and giving me the opportunity to work on a project right here in my hometown. Um, that's been a really, really cool experience. And even better is Candela is such a great company and enjoys giving back to the <coughs> communities it works in. So um, we're really, really excited to announce a $25,000 donation to Hardin County Schools to fund um, some STEM summer camps at the middle schools. Um, <laughs> Rick, do you want to say any words? Uh, so I didn't take much STEM. Uh, didn't take any classes with numbers in them in college. Big mistake. Uh, trying to maybe help some other people not make the same mistake. So, uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. We'll take that any day. Any day. We, we are extremely appreciative of that, and uh, we appreciate all our community partners. And if there's anybody else out there that would like to uh, donate money, we're more than happy to make a big presentation for you as well. Now, this time, seriously, if you would like to leave, <laughs> please feel free to do so. We'd love to have you stay, but we understand that uh, these meetings are called board meetings for a reason. I did want to thank Kenny Rambo real quick, Harlan Communications. He's helped, helped us make these connections the last two years with the Center for Energy Education and now through Candel to get us money to help fund our STEM. So, Mr. Rambo, thank you for those thank connections. You. Dr. Tanya Jury, the principal at Bluegrass Middle School. They obviously had their work ethic uh, interviews today. I was not able to make those due to some other meetings. But that what she sent me was a, was a picture, and it said uh, work ethic interviews today. Student offered a, a real job after interview due to, land, uh, to do landscaping for one of our interviewers. He accepted and parents agreed. The students were so impressive, my heart is full. So when, when you see an interviewer come up and say, oh, this kid's got the work ethic I like to have on my job site, 
And for the kid to have a summer job to make a little money uh, as an eighth grade student moving into high school, when they're going to be driving, they're going to be putting gas in a car. That says a lot about our students right here at Bluegrass Middle School. That's just one example. Uh, but I'm going to turn this over to, to Lisa Slavin here in a minute. She's going to talk a little more about work ethic, uh, what we're doing with that program, the longevity of it, how we're progressing. Uh, then we're going to have to talk about our 50 year anniversary, 50 year anniversary for HCC TV, and then we're going to finish with a department. Uh, information with our special education department. So it's a big night. Excited to have our kids here to celebrate and uh, sing for you guys. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so come on up if you're here. There she is. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. So we're here doing an update on our work ethic certification program. Impressively enough, and I don't think many people realize this, we are actually in our 10th year of doing the work ethic certification program here in Hardin County Schools, a groundbreaking program that has actually been shared across the state with numerous mm -hmm. other school districts and set the precedent where a lot of people are kind of recreating what we are doing here in Hardin County Schools in their own district. So it's pretty exciting to see that we're celebrating the 10th year. Being in the 10th year is definitely at the high school level. Um, it's just been the last three years that we took this district-wide and it is now a pre-k through 12 curriculum So we're making sure that students are demonstrating our grade 8 and work ethic standards at every single grade level um, With that in mind we were getting into the elementary schools this year to kind of check in on them being in their third year How's the program running? Are there additional resources we could assist you with all that kind of information? And while at Lakewood Elementary, Principal Clark shared with me that their wonderful music teacher, Miss Bennett, had actually taken the initiative to create a song about the Hardin County Schools Grade 8 Work Ethic Standards. And I thought, if somebody is going to take the time to take a new program like that and really embed it into their classroom, into their content, that has to be shared. Never mind the fact that music is near and dear to my heart. And I was like, okay, then the only thing we can do is make sure that this song gets heard loud and proud. So at this time, if Principal Clark can get her students up here, they are going to sing their song for you guys this evening. guys so much. Can we get one more round of applause, not only for our students, but Ms. Bennett as well? Um, and lastly, I would just like to take a second to invite all of you. We are 
in the midst of work ethic interviews right now, of course they occur at the end of each grade level, so fifth grade, eighth grade, and our senior work ethic interviews are happening across the district, and you guys are more than welcome to come and join us and interview some of the students, and feel free to offer them jobs as well, as we saw today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. That was wonderful. Proud of our Brown group there. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Very proud. Gina, you want to come on down? I am um, thrilled to announce this is the 50th anniversary of Hardin County Educational and Community Television. It was started in 1973, and I have John to go on to the next slide there. And here's some pictures from way back. Uh, you might notice a few people that you might know or not, but the program got started by Dr. Ernie Throw. He was a grant writer extraordinaire and uh, got some grant funding for professional development. And he thought it would be a great idea to videotape these and though he extended it to, why not make this a career pathway where our students are learning video production while we're filming those um, courses, and those professional developments. We continue to do that, and these are some of the pictures that we have for this year. One thing to keep in mind, we still use cameras, we still use students, we still have a switcher, so the equipment has basically continued to change and evolve, but for the most part, it's still the same tools. So, uh, this is some of the staff through the years. Um, Dick Thornton started the program in 73. Brad Mertens, of course, was the director for a really long time. Um, I've been here since 98, and then my present crew is on the uh, far right there, as you see. And uh, these are some of our success stories. Uh, some of those you may know, but um, uh, Wes travels the world taping all kinds of athletic and producing all kinds of uh, world Cup um, athletic events. Uh, Megan Shoemake Cable is the marketing guru of <coughs> Bob Claggett's I Like to Make Stuff. And, uh, and Jamie Pence owns Video Bread in Louisville. It's a multi-million dollar production facility in Louisville. Desiree Duncan's from John Harden, and she is a vice president of communications with Jefferson Community and Technical College. So that's just some of the individuals that have done really well. Um, of course, I think that what our students do is a success for the Hardin County Schools as well. So John, you wanna go to the next one? This just shows you a little bit about the television station itself. 40 hours every week is basically brand new programming. Uh, so annually, that's about two hours, 20, I mean 2,000 hours of programming, and 80% of that is Hardin County School promotion, education, informational, or entertainment. Um, in addition to the schools, we have government and community content, and uh, all of our students touch those products. And if we didn't have it, they wouldn't be produced. Um, of course, we still continue to do professional development taping, teacher modeling. We do instructional videos, and then we also work with local nonprofits and businesses. Um, this is truly, from the very beginning, a project-based learning application. Everything they do is a project, and everything they do is real. And it either, nowadays, it gets posted or streamed uh, just within hours of being produced. Go to the next one for me there. Um, this is some of our weekly programming and uh, monthly and weekly series. Um, everything up there, this is with the Hardin County Schools. Of course, our academic game shows, those have been going for 30 years, and we get requests for those all the time to post some. Bridges Over Barriers fe uh, features our Friskies. Same thing with uh, Cradle School. Uh, we have a cooking show with EC3. Focus on academics is what we honor here tonight, everyone that comes in. Uh, HCS Matters. John Wright hosts that, board meetings, of course, news and views is weekly, and so that just shows you some of the things that we do regularly, either monthly or weekly on the channel, and also on our YouTube channels too. And these are some of the special events that we do for the Hardin County Schools. So when you look at sporting events, Veterans Day, Black History Month, guest speakers, all of those things, and we're out and about, and April and May become an extremely busy time for us. Uh, and we've been using a lot of our middle school students, uh, those that are in their STLP programs, to work as videographers for us as well. And even elementary, uh, fourth and fifth grade students. So we'll go on to the next. This is just some of the things that we do for the local governments and community. And these events are paid for, they're contracted, or we have sponsors. Um, they support what we do, and I support what our students do because it gives them uh, just a great resume addition, but you know, they can bring up something and say, well, I, I taped this, I edited this, I directed this. And so by the end of their senior season, hopefully they've got a really nice rounded um, uh, electronic portfolio. 
this is our normal um, YouTube channel. So this is a video featuring my teacher and some of my students. I'm Justin Hornback. I'm the media arts teacher here at EC3. Uh, it's an honor to be here in this classroom. This is a dream come true for me to be to be a teacher. It was something I always wanted to do when I was a kid. Dream come true. I enjoy being able to work with the students. That's the obviously the highlight of all of it is getting to work and see them use their different creations and create things that they're really passionate about and then show that. Last trimester of the school year, um, the upper level students that were working on public service announcements came up with their own idea, their own thing that what they wanted to do a PSA on, broke it down, did storyboarding, did their filming of it, uh, and it was really cool and presented that to, to some judges here within the district and it was really neat just to kind of uh, sit back and watch the, the, the awesomeness happen. Everybody gets a, an opportunity to, to shine on their own individual talent. That's, that's what I like to do in the class is that everybody kind of does the same thing but everybody gets a way to shine in their own talent, which is really cool. So it's it's an honor to uh, to work with with the students and be here with Hardin County Schools. That's where I went to school, and now it's good where I get to teach. So it's uh, it comes full circle. It's really nice. I like media arts a lot because there's a lot of fun people in this class, and our projects are really great, and I get to like express my creativity. Um, and I enjoy editing and I enjoy filming and acting. It allows me to be creative and pushes me out of my boundaries in the best way possible. Media arts is about being able to be creative in your own style and being able to show what you can do with film and editing. Media arts meant to me that I could meet a whole new friend group that I would have never met outside of the class and it really meant a lot because now we have those lifelong lasting friendships that you would never get outside of the class. This is my first year in media arts and even as a senior I've worked as a paint intern producing 60 programs for ACEC TV. I plan on earning my Adobe Premiere Pro certification in May and attend WKU in film in the fall. Enjoy what we do. I can't possibly think of anything else I would rather do. Just absolutely love it. And um, I do think it's one of the most valuable things that we do for our district and our community. And unlike all other school districts that have media arts, none, none do the content, the quality content or the, the quality of it, I would say, and also just the experiences of it. So do you have any questions for me? So most of the students, uh, are they like co-op students at the end of their school years? Or? Oh, we sign them up as soon as they turn 15, they can become an employee of ours. And so therefore, even if they're not presently taking a class at EC3, they can still continue to work with us on assignments, you know, because they may have already gotten their Adobe certification by the time they're sophomores. And they continue to work with us throughout the school year as they move on up. And I do hire former students a great deal also. About how many students have we got participating in that program? You, with the last four or five years, it's been around the 60 range, 60 to 70 range. Now that's that's per trimester. Right. And so currently, I have 35 students hired, and of those 35 students that are hired, um, 10 of them probably work around 40 hours a month. So this is like an elective that they can start on at 15 and go all the way through? Yes. We even do an introductory class for incoming freshmen. We do a two-week summer intensive class if they'd like to get started with us because we know they, they like to do band and, you know, as a freshman they may not be able to take the career classes at EC3. So uh, we open that door. And um, I've reached out and the last two years I've been working with the middle school's STLP groups and been working with their students as well. And so hopefully that's a good feeder system into our program. So if you look at 60 to 120 students per year since 1973, literally in the thousands of media artists throughout that 50 years. And so uh, the contracts and grants and mm -hmm. sponsors is primarily what's paying for their time? So that pays for their wages except for the apprentice money yeah. that we've gotten recently. Yeah, that's for, a very recent thing, right? We have, yes. We haven't been doing that long. Correct. We haven't been paying for the work that they do during the day, mm -hmm. but we started last year, 
And so if they work at the studio or work out in the schools for us, they're paid their apprenticeship hours. Okay. And at night, but all the nighttime work is funded by sponsors and um, Brandenburg Telecom sponsors and contracts okay. and such. Wonderful. I don't have a question, but a, an observation since we're celebrating 50 years of, uh, of history, uh, and you might remember some of this, but in the 1980s, uh, Hardin County government did two really significant things uh, that affected the community. One was starting the 911 service. Mm -hmm. The other was starting cable television in the county. And when the county government decided to do that, they charged Dennis Gordon, who was our first planning director, Brad Mertens, mm -hmm. who was HCE TV director, and myself as county attorney, with the task of drawing up the uh, ordinance for the cable TV franchise and then evaluating all the applicants that we had. Mm -hmm. And one thing we made very sure of was that Hardin County Educational TV would have that channel too and would have full access to the cable TV uh, network once it got installed in Hardin County. And it's been, a, in my opinion, a tremendous success and I congratulate you on that. Prior to my tenure, we were on air for about five hours a day, um, but we went 24-7. So we are on air 24-7. And on three cable companies, Brandenburg Telecom, um, Xfinity, and Spectrum in Radcliffe, plus we live stream everything, so all over the world. One of the greatest things that I think we've been able to do is to do live streaming with graduations and awards, and it just warms my heart when I get a comment from a soldier you know, a mom serving in Afghanistan or Iraq that said, I got to watch my baby walk the stage. And that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Yes, and, yeah. it was and, and if you'd ask, very much appreciated. Thank you. I was going to say, uh, Ms. Morgan, when you talked about another school district doing one graduation with an alternative video production crew, wasn't it like $37,000 or $35,000? Yes, yes, they yeah. hired an outside agency and For one. they paid $37,000 to. <laughs> share their virtual graduation. It's, it's been great that, that with COVID, what we did learn <laughs> is that every day changed and every day challenged us to do something we hadn't done before. So that really opened all the possibilities up. And, and it was a little bit like, I don't think I can do that to let me figure it out. And we were able to do that, just like Rob did graduation last year and this year <laughs> with Central Harden. So we'll figure it out. Awesome. Any other questions? All right, thank you all. Thank I love serving you all. All right, that's all we have to focus on academics, but I think we have a special education department update for tonight. Just a few quick updates um, from the special ed department starting. Go ahead and go to the. Um, so, just kind of starting with some general information. Um, our child count increased by 140 students this year, um, some of which is probably COVID related. Some of it is with the growth we're seeing in the community and families are moving in. Some of those students are transferring in with disabilities. So we currently have 2,742 students with um, individualized education programs um, in the district. Our special ed department, I know a lot of people don't always know what makes up the special ed department itself, like the district department. Um, obviously, there's myself, the director. We have an assistant director. Um, we do have five educational consultants who um, work directly with the schools. They have schools that they're assigned to, and they work on mentoring teachers, helping administrators through difficult um, tasks and problems that need to be kind of brainstormed and problem solved. Um, really providing a lot of support on compliance and legal aspects of special ed. Uh, 13 school psychologists, that's our full-time school psychologists. Um, they, they basically, they have a lot of roles. Part of their role is evaluating students to determine um, eligibility for services. They also do a lot of mental health groups, um, individual counseling and things with students as well. Six occupational therapists and two physical therapists that are directly, they provide services directly on IEPs for students. Um, two teachers for students with visual impairments. Um, we actually have another one posted for next year, hoping to have three um, because our numbers there have increased significantly as well. Two teachers of students who have the deaf and hard of hearing um, and three administrative assistants. That's kind of under the umbrella of the district staff. 
Um, as far as number of staff working with special ed students in the district, we have around 174 special ed teachers. That number feels like it changes daily as the needs of the students change. 24 speech therapists, 83 paraprofessionals, and so that's that classified staff um, that's helping in those low incidence classrooms, helping with students with kind of more needs that are in general, general ed classrooms, um, and then two educational interpreters, which we're really blessed to have as well. Some celebrations. We have had significant growth in transition readiness for our students with disabilities over the past two years. Uh, we were at 30% for students with disabilities in 2021. That jumped to 50% last year and we're anticipating even more growth this year. We're still kind of, we, we still have some time to work on some kids. So um, we're, we're anticipating even more growth this year. Um, our project search site, which had previously been um, just at Dow Chemical, added a site at Baptist Health Harden as well. Our interns are having great experiences there. I mean, there's a couple of pictures of them. We've got students doing rotations in pharmacy and doing some of that work with um, not only medications, labeling and that stuff, but also going to patient rooms, delivering medications, taking, you know, payment and those kinds of things. Um, and then we have, we have students working in dietary and food and nutrition. We also have students working in like the um, supply area and I didn't I when I went on a tour there I didn't realize like that's a whole department in itself like running supplies up to different floors and things and so we have some students really getting some great work experience there as well um, our youth one year out data so every year we are mandated by the state to call every student with an IEP who graduated the previous year so one year after graduation we have to call all of those families or those students um, and our, our outcomes this year were phenomenal. We were well above the state in all areas. And basically what it's asking is, is the student employed or enrolled in some kind of post-secondary education program? Um, and so we, I mean, the target was around 17% for the state and we were close to 60% across the board. So phenomenal um, results with that. Um, more celebrations, um, co-teaching, we're continuing to make that a focus in the district and we're really seeing an increase in the number of teachers who are willing to to give it a try and try those um, small group models that help students have more more staff interaction more feedback more engagement um, we did receive uh, money from um, the american rescue plan for that kind of the covid money for special ed and we've been able to purchase a lot of curriculum and resources we're working on some inclusive playground equipment at several of our schools that have low incidence classrooms right now um, and a lot of professional development opportunities for staff. We also just recently received a transition grant from KDE um, to continue to work on transition readiness for students with disabilities and we're working on trying to focus on creating some entrepreneurship opportunities for some of our students who may not fit in one of the pathways that we already have but could do some work-based learning type things and so we're working on expanding those options as well. All right. All right, some, just some challenges that we have. Obviously, recruitment and retention of special ed teachers is um, no different than probably we're facing with gen ed teachers. Um, school psychologists are also, it's hard to find um, those. And, and some of that is, the, there's only three universities in the state that have school psych programs, and they cap their class at 10 each year. <laughs> so there's just not a lot graduating. Um, paraprofessionals, recruiting and retaining those also um, tends to be a challenge and there's various reasons there's a, the number of going into the field is decreasing um, trying to be competitive you know because our, our number of hours per day and our number of days per year is different than a non-education placement like sometimes that becomes a, tr a, a struggle especially with those paraprofessionals um, and the physical and mental demands of our our special ed instructional assistants there it's significant um, with behavior concerns with toileting, with lifting, with those types of things, it, 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 um, it, it can be a struggle to, to get people to really love that. <laughs> um, our special ed teachers, we have a lot coming in as option six, which essentially means they have a bachelor's degree in something else, and then they're coming to us enrolled in a program that maybe they have not started even taking classes yet. So the background knowledge is often limited and just trying to get them through those first couple of years of balancing like the legal and compliant part of special ed with obviously instructional outcomes and trying to, to help them figure out how to spend their time and learn both of those things um, at the same time. Um, and our low incidence and our specialty certifications, teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, teachers of the vision impairment, the applicants are very minimal. And again, some of that is attributed to university programs not offering those, as many of those. 
Um, increase in student needs, and I know we've kind of talked about some of that at previous meetings, um, just about the intensity of our student behaviors, requiring more specialized support and staffing, um, the frequency of some of those disruptive behaviors, and really trying to make sure that we're hitting the academics um, with those students to keep improving those outcomes. And then from a department standpoint, just the building and space issues of accommodating an increase in staff, the resources, the equipment, the records, the, we're, we're running out of space. So that is kind of becoming an issue as well. Um, an action plan, I don't talk about problems without an action plan. So <laughs> kind of some things that we're trying to do to, to address some of these is really being intentional about how we're using our department staff to make sure that teachers and administrators are supported with instruction and behavior as well as that compliance piece. Um, we've started doing newsletters this year to really increase teacher capacity of strategies, um, but also to help administrators with how to coach special ed teachers because many administrators don't have that special ed background. So trying to build their capacity to be able to give good feedback as well. Um, contracting services to cover the needs of students. Thank you guys for, the, for approving that contract for our speech therapists to, to provide those services um, for, for this year where we had some, some um, loss of staff due to medical leaves and things and trying to get services covered. Um, we're trying to do really targeted professional development. Um, this summer we have a pretty intensive plan for teachers to, to really go targeted and go deep so that they're getting good at one or two things and then we can continue to build that capacity. Uh, we've changed our walkthroughs this year. Previously, we've just done like a co-teach walkthrough, one or two per building from the district level. Um, this year, we're doing walkthroughs for all special ed teachers in a variety of settings to make sure that, that we kind of have an idea of what's happening with special ed across the district and, and making sure that teachers are getting positive feedback as well. Um, and then, like I said, continued discussions with administrators on those evidence-based practices for students with disabilities. All right, questions. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> um, for people who don't have a background in special ed, can you explain low incidence? I know yes. what it is because I've had it explained sure. to me before, but I'm surprised at what it meant. Yes, so low incidence essentially means it's disabilities that have a low rate of occurrence which generally means those students with cognitive levels below 55, so three standard deviations, I'm getting a little technical, but below 55, if average is 85 to 115, then we're looking at those kiddos whose cognitive levels and adaptive behavior levels are below 55. Um, they often need a lot of communication support. They often need a lot of medical and behavioral support as well. So um, the question I've been asked by people in the community is, well, doesn't low incidence mean that you don't need to help them much? And it's exactly the opposite. Right, right. Yeah, they're, they're typically our students who need the most support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and very specialized. Yes, support. yes. Okay. I think your figure showed 2,742 students had individual had IEPs. Right. That's about one out of every 5.5. Mm -hmm. Compared that's to other wow. districts, is that normal? Yes and no. Our ratios are a little high. Um, our biggest growth has been with speech students, and I think some of that is pandemic related. Okay. Um, those those students kind of that are coming in ages three to six have a lot of language deficits, and so I think that's a lot of it. Our numbers are high, and we're looking at it, and I'm encouraging those speech therapists to like, you know, really is it is it really a disability, or are we delayed because? of pandemic and we just need more time. Okay. Um, yeah. And I know that there's really burdensome uh, regulations on, you were talking about spacing and stuff. So the paper trails that you all have to keep. Yes. Uh, how long do we have to keep records? So we have to keep paper until students are age 25 at minimum. So it's, it kind of it kind of varies. It's 25, but then there's also a or so many years after they last received services. So and we can't convert those to digital no, and get rid of them. We do convert them when they get to that point because then there's a longer retention past that. But yeah. But physical paper. Physical That's paper. A lot of paper. It's a lot of paper. Because <laughs> these activities generate a lot of paper. Yes. Yes. Well, the results are very uh, encouraging. Like seeing, like seeing those numbers. Yeah. 
And just a quick shout out for Jessica and her team. I always talk about this. You know, our largest high school has 1,900 students. We have, uh, you know, Central Harden. We have North Harmon 1,600. Her team does with 2,700 students. So it's, it's, I always say it's the largest department here in the district other than what you see as a team at a school, except she has to do it within 23 facilities. And uh, she has, she's bound by a lot of laws and has to make some tough decisions, tough conversations. But I promise you, she puts kids first and what her focus on academics has been very uh, important part of instructional services. So I wanna appreciate her for that and say thank you. So thank you all. Thank you. And construction updates. We, we have the big guys here in person tonight. <laughs> so you don't have to listen to me stumble over uh, what's going on. Well, good evening. Um, thank you for having us here tonight, Ms. Morgan and, and Mr. Stiff asked me to put together and, and, and Tommy as well. Just sort of a, an update. Um, before we get going, I, I can always describe construction kind of as your typical bell curve. I think everybody knows what that is. It kind of starts slow, it ends slow. But somewhere in the middle, you're kind of at the peak of all activities. Um, that, that's a good descriptor of where the project is right now. Just about every trade is involved. Um, it, and if you've been on the site or seen the site, you can see areas of the building that are starting, starting to head off towards completion and other areas of the building that are starting to come up out of the ground. So um, we'll kind of walk you through um, a lot of the milestones, the progress tonight, uh, and a lot of what's happening this summer, uh, kind of a, a three or four month uh, projection. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tommy for a first few slides, and then I'll take it from there. I hope I can read that. I've got some new glasses. But um, yeah, uh, as Rob said, uh, we this is a very interesting part of the project because we do, we've got finished work going on at one end of the building and we're still coming up out of the ground with masonry and steel work. So um, John, if you go ahead. Um, I think I'd like to jump ahead if I could to, yeah, to that one. Hopefully you all are not colorblind without a corner here. But um, I've been talking to you the last couple of months about how the site uh, where we're staging material uh, is going to change. Well, it's going to have a fairly abrupt change uh, until this is a snapshot of August uh, when school comes back in session. Several things are, are going to be flipped. Uh, the light green at the top uh, is going to create an access uh, to what we call Area A, uh, which is the auxiliary gym and an adjacent uh, foyer, which accesses uh, the uh, existing gymnasium, which those two areas in the light blue are to be completed uh, when school starts. Um, Go, go back, please. Okay, uh, the, I, I call that a purple color. I think it's supposed to be a blue, but that's ongoing construction in that area. The yellow is uh, our construction staging lay down areas for m more material that we have coming in and actual construction activities. And then the light green is areas that we'll be turning back over to the school for, the, for their use. So um, phase projects are very difficult and um, I wanna say uh, that appreciate John and Joe and Rob staff and Mr. Isaac. Uh, I, I've been involved in a lot of projects and I think this project has gone exceptionally uh, well. Uh, naturally we've had some broken pipes or some electric cut off for short lengths of time, but uh, everybody is, uh, has worked together and, and uh, it's, it's been a real seamless project from my standpoint. Go ahead. So if you can keep picturing Tommy's diagram, the, the light blue colors, um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through, and, and again, if you've seen the plans, we, we've sort of broken it all up into areas. So the, the new auxiliary gym is actually, we call that area A, and then if you sweep around sort of counterclockwise, it, the, the sequence is A, B. Um, the, the big gym is actually C, and then to, to D and E. So I'll give you some progress photos. Oh, oh great. Make sure I get the right, ah, perfect, all right. 
So this is uh, a recent shot of Area A um, and some work that's going to be happening in the summer. So you can actually see that if you've seen the building, there's actually some, some windows in the auxiliary gym. Um, you can see here one of the ball goals being installed, the speakers in the space, it's been painted out. Um, and so we're really at a point in Area A, the auxiliary gym, of, of starting to really finish it out this summer. So the wood floor will go down in June, the middle of June. You can see the bleachers come in July and the final coat of paint and touch up, kind of button it all up, ready for use for school will be that uh, July 26th date. Um, so that, and again, this is sort of, again, if you remember the rendering I showed you in the beginning, I said it would, it would look like what we, what we showed you. Um, so this is the auxiliary gym, that new main entry uh, that takes you in. This again will be open uh, for students uh, this August. This is kind of up on the top deck of the entryway. So once you enter this space, this is sort of the, the atria that, that greets you. Um, again, it's got to get finished out, but this is that second floor deck. And I'll remind everybody, this is, this is one of the great benefits of the project. You, you, you never had a way to access the upper deck of the big gym from this side of the building, from this parking lot. So this is the feature, this entryway that ties that all together, gives you a new elevator uh, for people that need to access both the upper deck, lower deck with an accessible need, um, solves a lot of problems. And then, of course, as it continues, it starts to tie into uh, Area B and the, then the new classrooms, the, the ROTC space, the family consumer sciences on that end. Um, so it, it starts to become uh, recreation and, and gymnasium space and very quickly turns into educational space just on the right side of that entryway. And so continuing on that entryway, as I, I sort of described it, sort of the anchor, again, if imagining the rendering uh, in your head that was on the first slide, you probably saw on the corner kind of a series of punched windows. Well, this is that, that first outside corner uh, that sort of steps off um, the, uh, the old existing brick wall of the gym. And the one thing I'll, I'll so remind everybody, you can sort of see the building starting to encroach out towards 62. We're not done yet. So if you, again, look at the rendering, the library piece, all of that still has to come forward that much more. So one of the library entries is actually right here. The building will actually come out probably, gosh, another 40 feet or better um, towards 62. So it, it's, it's going to be reaching out to the road much further than it, it currently is. Um, which I think is a beautiful thing. I, it gives you that sort of front door effect that I think everybody has craved for Central Harden for so long. Um, it won't be mistaken where the front door is on this building. Um, <laughs> but the roof dry in for Area B, you can see we, we've got walls up, we've got precast deck, you know, basically all the structures here. And then, of course, in, in concrete block work, the, the electrical, the data, that's all happening concurrently with the block work. But we'll, we'll have the roof on this area dried in by the, the end of July. Well, one thing about that area, that will be one of the last areas of the building to be completed because we have to work our way out from, from the back side, which is, is that E or L? Yeah. Well, the kitchen yeah. area, yeah. Yeah. and we have to work out of there to get everything installed. So that will, the media center will be one of the last areas to, to be completed. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I, again, just sort of, you know, we do these kinds of projects and the board uh, embraces them to, to fix problems. And so uh, I think somebody mentioned just, uh, John, you know, this is your largest high school. If you've ever been in the building in certain areas when there's a class change, um, it's crowded. So one of the things that was very purposeful in the design is that the, the main corridors are, are very wide through the building. So you can start to see this one here, which is that, that entry that I showed you just a little while ago that kind of ties in from the parking lot into the library and the other classroom areas. You can see the, just sort of the width of the corridor um, that's available to the students to travel the building. Go ahead, John. Again, just a reminder with the rendering, um, again, lock this into your brain um, as I go through the, the pictures, but um, Area C is the big gym. This is one of the other areas Tommy mentioned will be opened up for August. Um, it's coming along, it's being finished out. Um, the bleachers will go in uh, June 20th, the wood floors once that's done, uh, June 30th. You can go ahead, John. 
So here's where we are. So if you remember um, the rendering, you can start to see some of the accent paint on the new work here. There's an accent paint band. In fact, I think the painter's up there maybe. Can't see, even my eyesight, I can't tell. But um, again, if you remember, this gym used to have a ceiling in it. Um, so that was a maintenance headache and then some uh, for your maintenance staff. So again, fixing problem, in the spirit of fixing problems, the ceiling's been pulled out. We've painted out the structure white, cleaned it up, new lighting, um, you know, will be a fantastic arena uh, for the district. Um, I mentioned the main sort of connector atria that ties everything in. This is the monumental stair that takes you from the low, this is just outside of the main gym. Back, uh, yeah, just on the other side of those doors. Actually, I'm on the wrong side. It's on this side. Um, but this stair is what greets you to take you from the lower level to the top level, and the elevator kind of sits just off to the corner. And then the other piece is all the locker room revisions. So this is down in the locker rooms. You can see it's starting to get finished out, painted out, nice, bright, and clean. So again, um, just sort of taking you around the building. So as you come around counterclockwise, we get into area E. Um, the building that you see, or the structure that you see here um, is the um, sort of, it's a piece of the cafeteria technically, but we, we, jokingly we, we always called it the Gemma Cafetorium because uh, it, it's, it's doing, it, and again it embraces some of the features that the old central cafeteria had where you sort of have um, uh, sort of tiered seating and, and sort of a social stair kind of effect. Um, not that this has a, a true social stair, but but this is basically it. You can see the framework going up. The library is actually on the other side of this wall, so it comes out beyond here. Um, but again, this, this thing, this gap that you see is the, the main street corridor, as I call it, is, a, is that nice big wide corridor that ties everything in from one end to the other of the building. And of course, all of this is gonna be progressing um, throughout the summer, catching up to the stat, you know, the, the, the progress that we've made on the other building. Um, the good news, as I said, the high water mark, we have material now, all the trades are there. It's, it's just sort of rolling along at this point. Um, so we're not really, uh, shop drawings are done and, and it's just at a good point where everybody knows what they're doing. And that is really it. So um, again, I invite anybody to drive by. It seems like there's notable progress every week. Um, and uh, as Tommy said, it's been a, been a fantastic project. So again, I just want to remind everybody of the rendering, just to sit back and wait, we will get there. So. Rob, before you step away, do, do you mind to share what part of the building is going to be coming down? Because a lot of people believe that we're just adding on ah, and they good. don't realize that we're going to be taking down some of the odor parts of sure. the building. Sure. John, can you go to, to I think that? it's about, it's the colored plan that, uh, I think it's the fourth slide there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah so, and actually this, this is even a little hard. Yeah, if you could zoom in, essentially go, yeah, that, let's hold it there. Um, so everything that you see in the, the blue and the purple here is the, um, uh, new work that's what we call phase one. Of course, the, the board has taken action on phase two here recently. So the, the plan that you see is the, after phase one and phase two are done, this is, this is what we have. So there's actually, you'll see this piece of construction here that is in white, but that is, that is basically phase two. Um, the freshman wing is still there, although it will be renovated. Um, there's a piece of the other uh, uh, mid-90s construction that is there. We're actually building um, new science and art rooms on the back side of that, so there's a new piece of construction through here. But everything that is um, back in this corner of the building, uh, which is the old uh, original middle school, central uh, middle school piece, uh, that will come down as part of phase two. Um, so in theory, basically once we get all of phase one done, we can start to load students into phase one, um, take occupancy out of the phase two piece, and then swing into construction for the phase two without a lot of disruption. As, as, as Tommy said, th this, this is really an orchestration. There are so many moving pieces. Um, Mr. Isaacs has been exceedingly gracious in some of the things we've asked him and the students and faculty to do. Um, that's that's going to continue for a while, but they will have new space. Um, 
and uh, getting getting them into that is sort of priority one right now before we get disruptive with with phase two. Uh, but to Miss Morgan, to your point, everything. So to sort of visualize it, um, sort of where the existing cafeteria is, the kitchen, the auxiliary gym that's there now, the administrative suite that's there, now, that that will all go away uh, as part of phase two. What, what had been Harden Central before it became Central Harden, the part that right. was Harden Central with the, the cafeteria pit and all that, yep. that's going away. That's going away. Yeah. yeah. It, it also happens to be the oldest part of the building yeah. uh, with that's fraught with lots of maintenance issues and probably is the one of the, the triggers for doing the project from the beginning. Here's how old it was. My high school prom was held in that building when it was yeah. not even new then, but yeah. it was somewhat <laughs> new. Yeah. yeah. And, and I will say, so the question may be asked, well, what's going back? So there is a new parking lot for staff, you know, new landscape. Um, there's actually the uh, 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 special education drop-off is at at that knuckle right there, so um, there's a they have their own entry on that side of the building, um, so that's that's part of the the phase two as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any all. other questions? All right. Consideration of the consent agenda. Um, we are approving John Harden High School DECA students to travel to Orlando, Florida, via commercial carrier. Uh, approval for Early College and Career Center HOSA group to travel to Dallas uh, via commercial carrier. I think that's for a national competition. Yes. Um, approval for East Harden Middle School 8th grade history club to travel to Washington, D.C. and James T. Alton 8th uh, graders to travel to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. Those are for uh, 2024. Financial services, we received financial reports. Um, we are approving a $2,500 donation from Walmart Corporation to College View Campus, a $3,000 donation from Valley View Baptist Church to the HCS Family Stability Program, mm -hmm. uh, a $1,000 donation from the Fort Knox chapter of the Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity to the Meadowview Elementary Family Resource Center, and then the $25,000 donation that we uh, had the presentation earlier from Candela Renewables uh, for the summer STEM camp programming of the district. And we, we love, love seeing those things. There's a lot of things we can't do without, without our community partners. Um, approval of the BG5 for the Lincoln Trail Elementary Project. Love seeing those fives. Um, approval of the construction documents and notice to bid for the Child Nutrition and Early Learning Center projects. Approval of the Bound Credit Union and German American Bank Affinity Card contracts with Hardin County Schools. Those are going to be debit cards. Debit cards that will get two cents at least for every swipe that parents and students make. So you can request those, and I think they will have each of the, you can request which high school uh, you would like to have on there, and that will be a way to uh, give back to the schools. Approval of the contract with Quadient Leasing for mailer and sealer machines, uh, some change orders for Central Harden High School Phase 1, and then we received some information on student accident insurance for the 23-24 school year. Uh, certified and classified personnel actions and uh, received minutes from the board and the SBDM minutes and that's it. Does anybody have anything they want to discuss, pull out, change? We're still funding the student insurance for all students, right? Yes, sir. Is it just accident or is it some health in that? It's all accident. No, just accident, accident, accident. No. insurance. It, the cost <coughs> for yeah. doing it district wide uh, is not much than just your athletics for sure. Yeah. Well, there's $25,000, we paid. Was I right on that? Or? What was the price? $60,000. I think it's good to keep it as well worth it. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I think John would agree with you on Worth that one. For students and the district. <coughs> so. yes. 
Uh, well, Madam Chair, I move we approve the consent agenda. I'll second the motion. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, any action items? Any new business? Superintendent's report. We're going to make this uh, really uh, simple because this is going on, I think, about hour six for our board today. <laughs> so just really want to compliment the great things happening in our district. Uh, mentioned earlier, we had a reality store this week, and the reality store allowed our students to choose a profession. After they chose their profession, they then had to... Uh, find out how much money they were going to make. They then brought that into a um, area and they found out the first person they had to visit was their uncle and their uncle took a lot of money from them and his name was Uncle Sam and some of the kids wondered why their uncle was so uh, <laughs> taking of their money. Uh, from there they were able to purchase a car and they were instructed you know, what kind of car would probably be most advantageous for them. Some took advice, some did not. Uh, others went to the next one of childcare. The young man who spoke to me, he said, I have three children, I didn't want any. And it's going to cost me about $1,200 a month in childcare. And now I'm going to have to go give my car back that I really wanted. <laughs> so, uh, but the best part of it, uh, we did have some students given to charity as well. Uh, we had one who plans to be a surgeon, so we were like, you need to give out a lot of money here. Uh, I don't know if John, we don't have that, but uh, the best part about this was we had representation from multiple community members here. We had the 4-H Extension Office, which trains everyone in this, but then we have all of these individuals to uh, volunteer their time. So we had uh, some magistrates to come to this. Uh, we had uh, those who sell homes. So uh, we had realtors there. We had people actually from a car company there to talk about what cars they should get. Um, this was a bound credit union and uh, they were there for student loans in case they needed to go to college and they didn't have scholarships and they needed to know how much that was going to cost them. Some of them, that surgeon found out that eight years of medical school uh, was going to be a lot of money and uh, they were gonna have to work really hard. So just again, um, West Point Bank was there, Abound, there were just uh, probably at least 50 community members there. And then the second picture, uh, Dr jury this is the young man she was talking about today we have really focused on work ethic certification it's not waiting until high school to start talking about this we start talking about it in preschool uh, starting kindergarten each grade level has different words that they uh, learn about and responsibility uh, we can start teaching that as early as preschool and what's their responsibility uh, so this young man was offered a job today after his eighth grade work ethic certification interview, which he'll be doing over the summer. Uh, but again, they had a lot of volunteers at our middle school, I know Ms. Cassidy can speak to that, uh, to come in and do these interviews to see how incredible our students are and the hard work that is happening uh, because of our staff working diligently on this day after day. So we're not saving it for their last year of high school. We're starting that very young. And then the other thing I just wanna remind people is teacher appreciation is actually for this year, May 8th through the 13th. We might have to do a calendar change on that. They've updated it. But I hope that you will support all of your teachers, paraprofessionals, all those who work in the schools. They work incredibly hard. Uh, we have students that we start working with in cradle care from you know birth until profession. And so we just ask that you send cards and I know each of our schools will be reaching out to tell how you can help them celebrate individually, but we really want to thank our teachers. Uh, teacher appreciation will be over by the next time we meet, but I hope our community will take the opportunity uh, to really appre show appreciation to our staff. So, Madam Chair, that's it. Thank you. 
I think we do need a brief executive session, is that yes. correct? Yes. Madam Chair, I move that we go into hopefully a brief executive session <laughs> to discuss the possible acquisition of real estate. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Well, we <laughs> motion to resume, uh, to... He made uh, a motion. I just need a second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. aye. All right, back in regular session. Okay. And do we have another motion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion at this time that the board authorize John Stith to engage in real estate negotiations on behalf of the board for possible acquisition of one or more parcels of property. And I second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. One more job uh, for you, John. One more, John. Uh, a motion to adjourn. Well, I was going to, I guess we're still taping, yes. Um, I was just going to run through. Oh, we have a very busy uh, calendar coming up. It's huh. the end of the year where we start having all, <coughs> all kinds of uh, fun stuff coming up. So April 25th at 6 p.m., there's a volunteer banquet at John Harden High School. May 5th, school is dismissed. May 11th at 6 o'clock, the HCS retirement dinner at EC3. May 16th, school is dismissed. Uh, it's election day. Uh, May 17th, we will have a special lunch board meeting. Our meeting next, uh, next month will be on Wednesday as opposed to Thursday. Uh, we've had some, some conflicts. We need to move that. So our uh, lunch meeting will be at New Highland Elementary. And then the evening meeting will be at the PAC. Um, and then we've got May 20th is College View, Hardin County High graduation. Uh, May 24th is Project Search graduation. May 25th is last day for students. That is also Central Hardin's uh, graduation at Broadbent Arena. May 26th is John Hardin's graduation at John Hardin High School. And May 27th is North Hardin graduation at North Hardin High School. And that's it. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>